This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Mosaic, a daily news program from Link TV, presents a selection of news reports from independent and state-controlled broadcasters from throughout the Middle East. In the Norwegian capital of Oslo, the American president Barack Obama received the Nobel Peace Prize in a ceremony at City Hall. In a speech Obama gave after he received the award, he said that the world cannot ignore the nuclear armament in the Middle East and Asia and that Iran and North Korea cannot be allowed to meddle with the international system. Obama urged the international community to take strict measures with countries that break the international rules. But it's also incumbent upon all of us to insist that nations... It is also incumbent upon all of us to insist that nations like Iran and North Korea do not game the system. Those who claim to respect international law cannot avert their eyes when those laws are flouted. Those who care for their own security cannot ignore the danger of an arms race in the Middle East or East Asia. The 27 EU foreign ministers who went to Brussels for a General Affairs Council meeting announced that they are extremely concerned because Iran continues to develop its nuclear program, ignoring all international calls for cooperation. The Council in its first meeting said that Iran did not exert any effort to rebuild confidence with the international community pertaining to the peacefulness of its nuclear program. The Council called on Iran once again to fully implement international resolutions as well as the resolutions of the International Atomic Energy Agency, specifically the resolution that was issued on November 27, 2009. The Council also expressed concerns about Iran's response to the International Atomic Energy Agency and previous offers. I don't believe that President Obama deserves the Nobel Peace Prize because he's not proven himself worthy of it, as he failed in the most important regions of the world. I don't believe that Obama deserves this award. Despite his good intentions, Obama has not achieved any practical results on the ground. Obama is not worthy of this award. A prize like this is usually given to a person who supports peace and seeks to make the world a more peaceful place to live in. As far as the issue of Palestinian human rights is concerned, Obama has exercised his NATO power against the Goldstone Report. I'm very much against, I'm very much against him getting the award. He didn't work toward achieving peace. In fact, he helped turn things for the worse in many countries, especially in our region, in countries such as Iran and Afghanistan. Obama has not taken tangible steps regarding the peace process between the Palestinians and the Israelis. I think he doesn't fully understand world affairs. No, he doesn't deserve the award. All presidents in the world are full of talk and no action. I don't think that Obama deserves the prize because he has not achieved anything practical on the ground so far. He is not worthy of this award. Arch terrorist and Fatah Tanzim leader Marwan Barghouti says that a deal for the release of abducted IDF soldier Gilad Shalit is on the verge of completion. In an interview published in today's London based Al Quds al Arabi newspaper, the jailed terrorist is quoted as saying that his release would serve the national interests of the Palestinian people. It remains unclear as to whether Israel has agreed to include the Fatah strongman in the prisoner exchange. According to Barghouti, Palestinian prisoners in Israel are prepared to wait until Israel frees all of them without reservations. He then voiced his hope that the deal will be finalized as soon as possible and that Israel will agree to all of Hamas' demands. Palestinian Authority President Mahmoud Abbas said that for now there is no prisoner exchange deal between Israel and Hamas. Speaking after a summit in Sharm el-Sheikh with Egyptian President Hosni Mubarak, 
Abbas said that the two sides have stalled on the details concerning the numbers and the identities of the Palestinian prisoners due to be released in exchange for IDF soldier Gilad Shalit. President Shimon Peres said today that Israel welcomes the amendments made yesterday to the Swedish proposal to recognize East Jerusalem as the capital of a future Palestinian state. Peres made the remarks as he accepted the credentials of the new European Union ambassador to Israel. At the same time, Peres said that there is a danger that such initiatives may delay peace negotiations. And meanwhile, Swedish Foreign Minister Carl Bildt today denied that any fundamental changes have been made to a European Union statement on the Middle East. Bildt also rebuffed Israeli criticism of the Swedish government, saying that he has no problem being pro-Palestinian or pro-Israeli because he is pro-peace. The Palestinian Authority welcomed the EU motion, while Israeli officials said that the European Union missed an opportunity to press for a renewal of negotiations. View of the very extremist draft presented by Sweden, uh, we think that the final result uh, is uh, much more balanced uh, thanks to the efforts of uh, uh, responsible uh, countries that have tried to make it uh, more uh, reasonable. The European Council's reaffirmation of its rejection of, Israeli, of Israel's annexation of East Jerusalem is a certain welcome. It is definitely something that needed to be said against the backdrop of the continued Israeli actions that, that run counter to international legitimacy, international law, and the fact, the historical fact, that East Jerusalem is an integral part of the Palestinian territory occupied in 1967. Uh, we call upon the Israeli government to cease all discriminatory treatment of Palestinians in East Jerusalem then, of course, there has to be negotiations on the future of Jerusalem. Uh, there has to be negotiation on everything. All of the issues are on the table. And we say that we will not recognize any changes to the 1967 borders that are not agreed by the parties. That includes Jerusalem. Uh, so we call on uh, genuine peace. A way must be found through negotiations to resolve the states of Jerusalem as the future capital of two states. The trial of Yaakov Title opened in the Jerusalem District Court today. Other than to say God is king, the 37-year-old defendant refused to respond to the charges against him. The alleged Jewish terrorist was arrested two months ago on two counts of premeditated murder, three counts of attempted murder, as well as involvement in 12 other acts of violence between 1997 and 2008. Prosecutors told the three-judge panel that Title's confession and forensic evidence tie him to the crimes. The resident of the West Bank settlement of Shavut Rachel is suspected of killing two Palestinians and carrying out a series of poison and bomb attacks. The identity of the IDF chief of staff's bodyguard, who was arrested 11 days ago on suspicion of attempted rape, was cleared for publication today. The suspect is 30-year-old Captain Erez Efrati of Moshav Batra. He is suspected of sexually assaulting a young woman at the Tel Aviv port after leaving a strip club during his own bachelor party. Efrati was today brought to the Tel Aviv Magistrates Court, where his remand was extended by five days. Prosecutors are expected to submit an indictment against him within the next few days. At the end of today's hearing, Efrati's fiance blew kisses at him and told reporters that she continues to fully support him and believe in his innocence. In his latest hearings, the suspect continued to deny all allegations against him, despite evidence that traces of his DNA were found on the victim's body. إذن هذه عناوين ساعة الإخبارية قبل أن نعرض التفاصيل نتوقف مع أبرز اختياراتكم كما نشاهد. Before we present you with the news, let us start with the news reports that received the largest number of hits. As you see on our website bbcarabic.com, the most visited topic is Obama receives a Nobel Peace Prize, as well as Israel builds an 18-meter-high wall along Gaza. Hamas denied that it knows anything about this wall. Egypt did not confirm that it is building it, but also did not deny it. Let us watch the following report so we can learn more about this subject. مشروع أمريكي التصميم مصري التنفيذ 
The project is designed by Americans and executed by Egyptians. It is a huge metal wall that is being built along the Gaza border. The Egyptian government started building this wall in order to eliminate smuggling through tunnels across its land. According to the Israeli Haaretz newspaper, the project, which is secretive in nature, aims at changing the way Egypt is dealing with the smuggling of weapons into Gaza. Haaretz also reported that American security experts came to the area to help Egyptians find the tunnels by using underground detectors. When the wall is completed, it will extend 10 kilometers in length and it will be 90 meters deep underground. The Egyptian government, however, has not confirmed this yet. This wall is not expected to stop all the smuggling, but it will close down the tunnels that are close to the land surface, which tend to be used to smuggle goods. Joining us from Rafah city in Gaza, our correspondent Shukti Al Kashif. Shukti, you are in the area where the wall is being built. Can you tell us more? Yes, of course. We are near the Salah Haddin Gate, which is south of the city of Arafah, in the southern part of Gaza. It is along the border between Egypt and Gaza, which is an open area, of course. Mm -hmm. This wall that we see is a separation wall between Egypt and Gaza. It was built last winter in the beginning of 2008, after the previous wall, which was much higher, was blown up by armed Palestinians, so the Palestinians could enter Egypt. We can also see massive digging equipment inside the Egyptian side, about 50 meters away from the separation wall. This is some of the digging equipment. More can be seen in the area. It can reach 30 meters deep. This is what the people in Arafah told us. They reiterated that a large number of tunnels were completely destroyed because they were penetrated by digging equipment. We can see other large equipment in the area. We must say that we are at the Salah Haddin Gate. There is also digging equipment about one and a half kilometers away from this area in Al Brahma. Also, about one kilometer away from here, to the east, in Al Salam neighborhood, there is also digging equipment. We can see the equipment from afar. Therefore, we can confirm that the digging is going on on the Egyptian side of the border. When did the project start? The residents in the area confirm that they have started hearing this equipment digging about eight days ago. The digging starts about five or six in the morning and continues for 12 hours. A few moments ago, this large digging equipment was being operated. Also, foreigners who are believed to be American nationals were in the area for weeks to survey the area. We have eyewitnesses that we can talk to if we have time. Abu Labed is one of the residents here. Abu Labed, do you hear digging in this area in the morning or at night? May God bless Prophet Muhammad. They start digging in the early hours of the morning when I perform my morning prayers. We heard that they want to build a wall extending from the sea to Karam Abu Salam checkpoint. This wall will suffocate Gaza even more. Do you feel that this wall will affect the people in Rafah as an example? Of course the tunnels that are close to the surface are used to smuggle milk and food into Gaza. We are forced to do that because the Israeli checkpoint at Karam Abu Salam 
Ramadan closes often. We are calling on President Mubarak to bring the food directly to us so that the Egyptians can benefit from trading and let the people of Gaza live, instead of sending the food containers to Karam Abu Salam checkpoint. He says that we are Palestinians, so why is he building a wall between us? Why doesn't he take down the wall instead? I have one last question for you. Do you hear digging on the Palestinian side of the border in Rafah? Of course we hear digging in the early hours every morning. The people say that they want to destroy all the tunnels. They want to suffocate Gaza even more. They want us to surrender. Strawberry farmers in the Gaza Strip are bracing for financial losses due to plummeting prices, which are expected to hit their lowest level this year. According to the farmers, it takes a lot of money and efforts to grow strawberries in the Gaza Strip. The farmers complained about the ongoing ban on the export of strawberries to foreign markets due to the Zionist siege on the Gaza Strip. Strawberries are one of the most important exports of Palestine. Since the siege on the Gaza Strip and the closure of commercial border crossings with the occupation authority, Palestinian farmers started to see their business dropping off significantly. Around this time each year, farmers in the Gaza Strip begin to harvest their crop and export it to foreign markets. This year, however, Gaza farmers have no choice but to sell their crop in the local market at very low prices. The price of strawberries is four Israeli shekels per kilogram at the local market, as opposed to 30 shekels when sold at the European market. This, along with the siege, have cost Palestinian farmers major financial losses. Each denim of strawberries costs nearly 8,000 shekels. When I sell a ton of strawberries at 2,500 to 3,000 shekels, I will incur a loss of 5,000 shekels. Each denim will result in a loss of 5,000 shekels. At these figures, I don't generate any profits. I'll be lucky if I break even. The only thing that I have achieved was to incur more debt. I might as well sit at home and quit farming. Many Gaza farmers are expressing fear that they will not be able to grow strawberries next year due to the high cost and risk associated with the product, not to mention the Israeli siege, which is forcing them to sell their crop locally at very low prices. The problem is further compounded by the ongoing Israeli campaign, which includes the uprooting and bulldozing of Palestinian land. The Israeli occupation forces have bulldozed thousands of dunams of strawberries in Gaza. We have been growing strawberries for nearly four years. We used to export the crop to the international market. Now we have no choice but to sell it at the local market below market value. We used to sell the crop in Israel at 40 shekels per kilogram. Now we sell each kilogram at three shekels in the Gaza market. Given this, we will not be able to grow any strawberries next year. Any product is useless when you don't have the market for it. We used to export the crop outside the country and some to the West Bank and to the local market inside Israel. Now we are forced to sell it at two or three shekels per kilogram. Fear has become the common denominator for Gaza farmers and residents, as both are facing bitter living conditions due to the Israeli siege and the closure of border crossings. Meanwhile, the international community continues to ignore this Palestinian issue and its implications. Despite the abundant production of strawberries this year, the losses incurred by the Gaza farmers are larger. The occupation authority is seeking to prevent the farmers from planting their land and exporting their products. All these factors may force Gaza farmers to stop growing strawberries in the next years. Shadi Shamia, Al-Aqsa Channel, from the town of Bet Lahia in the northern Gaza Strip. During a rally marking the International Day of Disabled Persons, several Palestinians with special needs have called for the lifting of the unjust Zionist siege imposed on the Gaza Strip. The anniversary comes as the Zionists continue carrying out their aggressive campaign, which fueled the problem of disabled Palestinians. According to a report by Human Rights Watch, the highest percentage of people with disabilities was recorded in the Palestinian territories, measuring at 3.5 percent of the total population.
بعد يوم واحد من إرجاء الانتخابات التشريعية الأردنية إلى أجل غير The Jordanian monarch King Abdullah II has accepted the resignation of the government of Nadir Thahabi. This news comes after Jordan indefinitely postponed the country's legislative elections. The Jordanian monarch has appointed Samir Rifai to head the new government. The designation came with a royal decree urging the new prime minister to move forward with economic reforms. Salwa Sawaka reports from Jordan. After dissolving the parliament and the postponement of the legislative elections, the Jordanian government got the axe. Jordan's prime minister, Nader Dahabi, submitted his government's resignation to the Jordanian monarch, with the latter accepting it and immediately appointing Samir Rifai to head the new cabinet. The resignation of Dahabi's government was highly expected among the Jordanian public. The decision was prompted by the government's failure to implement economic reforms launched two years ago. Based on public polls evaluating the government's performance two years after its formation, the government has not achieved what it was poised to do regarding economic reforms. It was once known as an economic government with an excellent record. However, two years later, Vahabi's government is being sharply criticized over failure to implement economic reforms. The acting prime minister has several tasks, including holding transparent parliamentary elections and working with members of his cabinet to help deal with poverty, unemployment and corruption due to the global financial crisis. Political observers voice their confidence in Rifai's ability to deal with the challenges facing Jordan. We have confidence in the new government and the prime minister. We hope that the government will devote itself to the service of the country. We also hope that this government will be able to correct all the negative implications facing the Jordanian public. The government must continue moving forward with the development process. The Jordanian kingdom is witnessing major political maneuvers aimed at pumping fresh blood in the main chambers of the Jordanian state and its command centers, which is necessary to help deal with any foreseeable shortcoming. After the formation of the government, the Jordanian public is now waiting for the announcement of the new cabinet members. Having said that, the Jordanian citizens are more concerned about the ability of the government in meeting their needs and helping resolve their economic problems. Salwa Salwaka, Dubai TV, Amman. After presiding over a parliamentary session, the Pakistani Prime Minister Yusuf Rida Ghilani unveiled measures to reduce security deterioration in Balochistan. The measures include a pardon of dozens of wanted suspects, the withdrawal of the army from several areas in the region, and the lifting of several military roadblocks. A semi-military force will replace the army in the region of Balochistan. By the order of the Prime Minister, the army has completed its withdrawal from the area of Kulo and it was replaced by a semi-military force. The Ministry of Interior has issued a statement on the matter. We will do the same very soon in the area of Siwa. We are planning to build three bases for the semi-military forces and we will employ youth from Balochistan in all institutions. Meanwhile, several tribal leaders called on the Pakistani government and the Taliban to end military confrontations and resort to dialogue. During a meeting that was organized by the Islamic group of Bishawar, the tribal leaders called for an end to the United States raids in the tribal regions. Retired generals, politicians and clergymen held a meeting in Islamabad to urge the Pakistani government to add conditions to their cooperation with the U.S. Our Al Jazeera correspondent Ahmed Barakat has the details in the following report from Islamabad. In searching for ways to end the raging war in the tribal areas and its implications on Pakistani cities, the Pakistani Islamic group held a broad meeting for the tribal leaders in the city of Peshawar. The participants called for replacing the war with dialogue. They also called for the immediate cessation of military operations and ending U.S. drone raids. The tribal leaders also called for the implementation of Islamic Sharia law in Pakistan, as it is the only way to achieve unity in the country. The American plan for Afghanistan, in effect, is intended for the Pakistan tribal area. Therefore, we must be ready. We must start the jihad any way we are religiously obligated to do so.
This civic movement coincides with another movement led by retired generals, former politicians and party leaders. They warned about dreadful consequences if the situation continues the way it is. They urged the government and the armed fighters to put their differences aside for the sake of the country. Some believe that the crisis in Pakistan is caused by the poor governing system. Our nation is lost. One time it adopts a republican system, and other times adopts a different system. Our nation must go back to the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad. Regrettably, our leaders who take office often trick people. They govern against the willpower of our nation. Political observers believed that the armed attacks, which recently have increased in numbers and intensity, put a great deal of pressure on the Pakistani people and the government. Now, finding a solution to end the conflict between the government and the Taliban is a major demand. The statements by the Pakistani defense minister that the U.S. is using two military bases in Pakistan without an agreement with the government, as they are based on a previous arrangement with the former president Pervez Musharraf, have provoked the anger of the opposition. The opposition believes that the Pakistani-American cooperation is a violation of Pakistan's sovereignty. Iraq's Prime Minister has made a rare visit to Parliament just days after a series of blasts killed some 130 people and injured hundreds more in the capital Baghdad. Speaking to Parliament, Nouri al-Maliki blamed political disputes for putting the country's security at risk. He called on lawmakers to decide on depoliticizing security forces. Maliki also said the rival political faction's failure to reach consensus on the appointment of a new intelligence chief was impeding the intelligence services. The post has been vacant since Major General Abdullah Sharwani quit the job after another deadly twin blasts in August. Top Iraqi officials are pointing their fingers at Saudi Arabia over the recent bomb attacks in Baghdad. The head of the Ordnance Department of Iraq's Interior Ministry says the terrorists used explosives that came from abroad. Major General Jihad al-Jabiri says the explosives had been taken into Iraq, supported and financially backed by other countries like Saudi Arabia. Earlier, Iraq's Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki had also said that Baghdad bombings had been carried out with the help of a regional country. Al-Maliki has appeared in Parliament on Thursday to answer MPs' questions about the attacks. At least 127 people were killed and hundreds wounded in a series of coordinated bomb blasts in Baghdad on Tuesday. Get more news about the Middle East online at linktv.org mosaic. The Mosaic webpage offers a complete archive of Mosaic programs, program transcripts, the Mosaic video podcast, and the Mosaic Intelligence Report, a weekly analysis of the hottest stories from the Middle East. The views expressed on Mosaic are those of the participating broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible with the support of viewers like you. Thank you. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non-commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.